out of all the stories you're going to hear today, uh, by far the most favourite story from this part of the world is a great British classic. It's a very, very sad story, but also an extremely well documented story about a group of people that have gone down in history as the Pendle Witches. So let's turn the clock back in time to the year 1603. At that period of time, we had a fantastic queen on the throne of England called Queen Elizabeth I. She led by example. She defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. And when she died in 1603, she felt some guilt. She felt some guilt that she'd had her cousin, uh, Mary Queen of Scots, actually executed. And she insisted on her deathbed that her son, King James VI of Scotland, should become King James I of England. And he was indeed. Now, King James um, took over in 1603, an ardent Protestant. He hated the Catholics with a vengeance. He also wrote a book called Demonology. And as you pick up the book, How to Find a Witch, How to Try a Witch, and most importantly, How to Eradicate a Witch. Throughout the whole length of Great Britain, the area known as the Forest of Pendle seemed to stick out like a sore thumb. It was away from society. Um, the king had a suspicion on the area, mainly due to the many Catholic families that lived in the area. The Southwest of Preston, the Townies of Burnley, the Shyburns of Ribble Valley, they were all Catholic. So he had his, um, his suspicion on the area. Caught up in all this paranoia were a group of people that would go down in history as the Pendle Witches. They lived around Pendle Hill in a huge deciduous forest called the Forest of Pendle. Two of them were very, very elderly ladies. Uh, a lady known as Elizabeth Southern and another lady known as Anne Whittle, commonly known as Chetwax and Demdike. Let's call them by their, their nicknames. Demdike lived in a small cottage called Malkin Tower. When I say a cottage, it was a one-roomed limestone hovel where the wind would howl through it. She had lost her husband, but she did have a daughter called Elizabeth Device, and she had three children, James, Alison, Jeanette Device. They all lived at Malkin Tower. Living nearby was Anne Whittle, commonly known as Bessie Chattox, in the village of Newchurch in Pendle, with her daughter Anne Redfern. These were the main Pendle witches. It's really hard to try and imagine what life was like in the early part of the 17th century, but first of all, you've got no doctors, no surgeries, no dentists, no supermarkets. You lived off the land. It was a very, very tough existence, and life expectancy, if you were lucky, would be 35. In the case of Demdike and Chattox, they were both over 85. Many historians believe that they lived for so long because they knew all about plants, and of course, all modern medicines come from plants. But our story starts on the 18th of March, 1612, when Alison Device, she's the granddaughter of Elizabeth Southern. She's 14, and she has a walk along the length of Pendle Hill. As she makes her way into the market town of Cone, she had the misfortune of meeting a Halifax peddler called John Law. When I say peddler, John Law was basically a walking salesman. A large pack in his back, full of 1612 luxuries, he would go from village to village selling his wares. He was also like a bit like a, a walking newspaper, if you will. He had the misfortune of meeting young Alison. Alison was dressed in rags and she begged of him. Oh, please, sir, please, sir, you can spare a few pins to pin me clothing together, sir. Just a few pins, sir. Get away with you, shouted John Law. I'm not taking me pack off for you, lass. You've got no money. You're no use to me. Oh, please, sir, just a few pins, sir. Get away with you, shouted John Law. According to John Law, the Halifax peddler, out of the mist, out of the heather, appeared a huge black dog. The dog sat next to Alison. The dog turned to look at Alison. And the dog talked. Alison, I can lame him for you. Lame him! Lame him, she screamed. John Law felt this terrible pain on his left arm, his left leg, and the left side of his face, and collapsed in agony beneath the shadow of Pendle Hill. He lay there for five long hours. The kind people of Cone could see him. They got a stretch team together and they carried him down the slopes of Pendle Hill into an old alehouse which is long since gone called the Greyhound Inn. There the landlord Jonathan Edrington spoon fed him. He cleaned him and as Law's voice returned Law shouted I've been cursed! There's a witch in the forest a young lass with your dog I swear to you I heard the dog talk. Send letters back to my family. Edrington 
the landlord of the Greyhound Inn, wrote a series of letters back to Halifax, and John Law's eldest son, Abraham, received the first letter. Eh, me, me, me father's in trouble. Uh, I better go and collect him. He set her from Halifax, arrived in Cone, and walked into the old Greyhound Inn. There he saw his father in a twisted and contorted state. Uh, father, what's happened to you, man? You look terrible. Abraham, I was at Forrester Pendle. I met a young lass called Diva. She's got a dog. I swear to you, I heard the dog talk. She's cursed me, lad. She's in league with devil. I want you, lad, to go and find her. Bring her here. Reverse the curse. Well, Abraham must have been a very, very brave lad. He set off and walked uh, from Cone deep into the forest of Pendle through these twisting pathways and found the cottage known simply as Malkin Tower. He hammered on the door. The door opened and there was James Device, Alison's brother. Uh, can I help you, sir? I want to see Alison Device. Where is she? Uh, in here, sir. Alison came to the door. Right, last year, come in with me. Against her wishes, against her will, she was dragged from Malkin Tower through the twisting pathways of the Forest of Pendle and into the old Greyhound Inn in Cone. There she made eye contact with John Law, the Halifax peddler. Law looked up from his sick bed. It's you, your witch, your curse master, didn't that dog you had? I heard it talk. You ain't league with the devil, aren't you? This 14 year old girl, on bended knees, burst into tears and begged and begged forgiveness. She had no idea. She just admitted to a state capital offence of witchcraft. And strangely, John Law, the Halifax peddler, was about to forgive her. And the whole story would have ended there. But not his son, Abraham. Oh, no, we'll have you for this. I'm going to go and get magistrate. Now, the local magistrate was called Roger Noel. He lived in the village of Reed near Burnley. He had his book of demonology. He was fully aware of the king's paranoia and also fully aware that if he could convict this young girl, he was going to curry favour with the King of England personally. So therefore, Alison was arrested. She was brought to Reed Hall, Burnley, where she uh, burst into tears for the second time inside 24 hours and admitted to witchcraft. But she gave Roger Noel, the local magistrate, a lot more information. My grandmother, Demdike, she's a witch. So is Bessie Chattox and her daughter Anne Redfern. We have familiars. Familiars, said Roger Noel. Yes, sir. Dogs. Tib. Ball. Fancy. Dandy. These dogs belong to the four of us, sir. They came to us at different times of our lives and they talked to us, sir. They said, look, we can give you special powers, but in return, we need to suckle from your flesh and take your soul, sir. We also make clay pictures. Clay pictures, said Roger Noel. Yes, sir. Dolls made of clay but with long, long hair and teeth that we have taken from the corpse of New Church Cemetery, sir. Roger Noel was actually delighted. He wasn't in any way scared. He was delighted. He had a confession. He gave orders that Demdike, Chattox and Redfern should also be arrested, and they were brought to Reed Hall, Burnley, where they met young Alison. Now, there was no love between Demdike and Chattox. These two women actually hated each other. They were both over 85. They were both involved in making herbal remedies. And it was said that Chattox broke into Malkin Tower and stole items of clothing and a bag of meal. There was no love between these two in whatsoever. So therefore, under interrogation, they tried to blame each other. They put the, the blame on each other's shoulders. It went round the table three times and came back three times. But in doing so, all four of them admitted to witchcraft. And they made the long, long journey from the beautiful forest of Pendle, over the trough of Boland, and into the city of Lancaster. There they are chained to the floor in what we call the Well Tower. A very, very deep, deep underground dungeon. There they are fed on bread and water, in total darkness, and they are going to wait for four long months until the trials begin. In the meantime, deep in the forest of Pendle, at the little cottage known as Malkin Tower, Elizabeth Devise is rather concerned about her, her mother, Demdike. She's very concerned about her daughter, Alison, and she organises on Good Friday, 1612, what has gone down in history as the Good Friday meeting, where all these other so-called witches met deep in the forest of Pendle. It was like a scene from a Shakespeare play, as Alison's brother James slaughtered the sheep uh, from the fell. They dined on fresh mutton, 
Uh, they got a large cooking vessel called the cauldron and lit a fire beneath the cauldron. The black sip of liquid inside began to bubble and steam. In that black bubbling liquid went crushed, powdered human teeth and the odd clay pitcher. The whole idea, apparently, was to get a potion together to blow the gates of Lancaster City Castle open and rescue their loved ones. However, nothing happened. What did happen is word of the Good Friday meeting reached the ears of Roger Noel, the local magistrate. A meeting, you say? I want these people arrested immediately. When word filtered into the forest of Pendle of imminent arrests, three people thought, there's no way we're hanging around. Christopher Howgate, his wife Barbara, and Isabel Sigros, they left the area, but in doing so, they saved their lives. The ones that were successfully arrested from being at the Good Friday meeting were Jeanette Preston of Gisborne, West Yorkshire, Catherine Hewitt and Alice Gray of the town of Cone, Margaret Pearson of Padium, Elizabeth Devise, James Devise, Jeanette Devise of Malkin Tower, John and Jane Bullcock from Blackhoe, a mother and son, and the real star of the whole show, Alice Nutter of Ruffling. They are all sent to Lancaster, with the exception of the two Jeanettes. Jeanette Preston comes from Gisborne, West Yorkshire, so therefore she is sent to the city of York and paraded in front of the York City Magistrates. Um, her husband goes with her and begs for her release. Villagers go with her and beg for her release. But the judges look rather sheepish. The king has signed her death warrant. She was dead before she even arrived here, which horrified her husband. The accusations were, first of all, witchcraft. She'd been nursing her employer, Mr Thomas Lister, in Gisborne. He had a very, very high fever. She was nursing him. He died. She wrapped his body in a clean white sheet ready for burial. And two days before the burial, she touched the sheeting and some fresh blood came from the sheet. This was classed as witchcraft. She made a plea of not guilty, but was found guilty on the evidence of the jury against her. And she became the very, very first of the Pendle witches to be executed on the 27th of July, 1612, in front of huge, huge crowds in the city of York. The other Jeanette was the little girl that lived at Malkin Tower, whilst her grandmother Demdike, her mother Elizabeth, her brother James and sister Alison had been sent to Lancaster. She was sent to live with the local magistrate, Roger Noel. She had nice clothes to wear, lovely bed to sleep in, and three meals a day, and she was only too happy to incriminate her whole family. Roger Noel, the local magistrate, writes to the King of England personally, and he writes back, Mr Noel, sir, I must congratulate you on your marvellous work in apprehending these witches. I shall send two circuit judges from the City of London, James Oltham, Edmund Bromley, and a young boy called Thomas Potts. He can write very, very quickly. And I suppose in many ways that's why we're here today, because Thomas Potts wrote a book in 1613 called The Wonderful Discovery of Witches in Lancashire. And we have to rely on that book as being the only window on the whole story. We have to rely on that book being honest and truthful, as it's the only record of this rather, rather sad event. The trials began in August 1612 in the city of Lancaster. Demdike, Elizabeth Southern as we know her, she defied the court to the very, very end, and she died before the trials began, probably because of the harsh treatment that had been meted out to her. She'd been probably starved to death. She was also over 85, and being chained to the floor in the clothes you were uh, arrested in for four months is not very pleasant, really. In her absence, she was found guilty of the murder by witchcraft of Rafe Ashton of Downham, the child of Richard Baldwin of Burnley, a little baby girl, and indeed Henry Mitten of Ruffling. Because she was actually uh, dead, she couldn't actually make any plea whatsoever. But the next person was indeed Bessie Chattox. She was brought up from the cells, and Thomas Potts um, mentioned that she looked very like a skeleton in ranks. The poor woman saw daylight for the very, very first time in four months. She was starving, she was lapsing in and out of consciousness, and she would not have looked a pleasant sight. She was found guilty on the evidence of the little girl Jeanette Device, who was picked up and put on top of the desk, and she told the jury how these dogs had arrived at Malkin Tower, and how these dogs had told them to fashion clay pictures, and how these dogs had told them to crumble the clay pictures over the fire, and people were dying very quickly. Her mother Elizabeth shouted, Stop it, Jeanette! 
You don't know what you're saying. Have my mother removed from the court, sir. She's upsetting me, sir. And her mother was taken downstairs. Bessie Chatterton was found guilty of the murder of John Device, Anne and Robert Nutter, and Hugh and Anne Moore by fashioning the clay pictures. She made a plea of not guilty, but was found guilty by the courts at Lancaster. Her daughter, Anne Redfern, was then brought in, and Anne was found guilty of the murder by witchcraft of Robert Nutter, uh, the same victim as her mother. She made a plea of not guilty, but was found guilty. Then came young Alison Device. Remember, uh, she uh, had admitted to cursing John Law, the Halifax peddler, and she'd more or less, uh, she'd more or less um, convicted herself, really. Uh, but she was told in court, was there any way she could reverse the curse on John Law, the Halifax peddler? She said, only my mother can do that, sir. And she is dead, sir. Then came James. Now, James is class, really, as a bit of a dimwit, really. He self-incriminated himself, like his uh, sister Jeanette, by mentioning how these dogs arrived at Malkin Tower and how these dogs had given them special powers. He also mentioned if you were to go to Malkin Tower and start to dig near the main entrance, you will find two clay uh, effigies, two clay pictures. And these were brought into court and used as evidence against him. But in having said that, he freely admitted to witchcraft. His state of health was terrible. He was basically skin and bone. And uh, like uh, the rest of the people who had been interned, he was suffering from severe malnutrition. Margaret Pearson of uh, Padding was brought in. Now, she was found guilty of witchcraft, but they couldn't actually find any evidence against her. So therefore, she was given one year imprisonment. Um, Catherine Hewitt of Cone was brought in. She was found guilty of the murder of Anne Folds of Cone by witchcraft. But her friend, Catherine, um, her friend uh, Alice Gray, was actually found innocent of the crimes against her. She went home. She couldn't believe how fortunate she was. Now, this is where the story takes a very, very sinister Sinister, sinister twist. First of all, in 1612, women were not permitted to have a brain. Uh, when it came to male chauvinism, women suffered terribly at that period of time. By far the biggest star of this whole story is a lady called Alice Nutter. Alice was 60 years old and she lived at Ruffley, this rather beautiful village in the forest of Pendle. Um, she had a huge problem. She owned land. She had... Um, she had uh, tenant farmers, John and Jane Bullcock, her mother and son, and they came to see her. Uh, Mistress Nutter, uh, we're losing land, uh, someone's pushing our fencing back, and someone's taking sheep and cattle. Could he do something about it? She said, I shall go and see Mr Noel, the local magistrate. She did do, and he didn't do anything about it. So therefore, Alice thought, I'm going to go and see the senior magistrates at Lancaster. She walked into a court session to the words of, It's a woman! A woman! Get her out! A woman! Get her out! She grabbed all the furniture. The warden's tug, but she wouldn't let go. And the judges said, well, let her have her say. In one day, she won all her land disputes fairly and squarely and left the city of Lancaster a free woman. However, in the courts that day was Roger Noel, the local magistrate, and the senior magistrates reprimanded him for not doing his job properly. He thought, I need to get rid of this woman. How can I get rid of her? The trump card up his sleeve. The little girl, Jeanette Devise. For the second time that day, she was picked up and put on top of a desk. And Roger Noel said, um, Jeanette, these three people here, John and Jane Borcock, Alice Nutter, were they at your home, Malkin Tower, on Good Friday in the Forest of Pendle? They were, sir. A look of shock and horror came across John and Jane's face and Alice's face as they realised on the evidence of this little girl they were being found guilty of witchcraft. And the jury believed that a little girl could not be manipulated and they were found guilty of witchcraft. In the case of Alice, she was found guilty of aiding Alison Device and her grandmother Demdike in the murder of Henry Mitten of Rough Lee because he wouldn't give her a penny. In court, she scoffed, sir, I don't need to beg. I'm a woman of wealth, sir. But use a modern term. To use a modern term, she had indeed been well and truly stitched up. The Pendle witches were all executed on the 20th of August 1612 in the city of Lancaster in front of huge, huge crowds and then their bodies burnt. A witch's body has to be burnt apparently to cast away all the evil. Watching that day was the little girl, Jeanette Device, holding the hand of Roger Noel, the local magistrate, who she thought was his friend. She watched her entire family die that day, the inhabitants of Cone, the landowners die. And as soon as they stopped twitching the pillory, 
Noel said, Goodbye. She said, But surely, sir, I'm going back to that lovely warm house of yours, sir. Goodbye. He'd used her. She made the long, long journey back to the forest of Pendle, knowing full well that her evidence had claimed the life of her entire family. As for the two circuit judges, James Oltham, Edmund Bromley, they were both knighted. Roger Noel was later knighted and made the High Sheriff of Lancashire. Thomas Potts wrote his book, The Wonderful Discovery of Witches in Lancashire, which earned him a fortune. We do know that young Jeanette survived because three years later, the poor girl is rearrested. Um, a young boy called Edmund Robinson from the town of Nelson uh, was making his way through the forest of Pendle and saw her commit acts of witchcraft. At least that's what he said. Of course, with her family reputation, this is taken very, very seriously. And um, she is indeed arrested. She's sent to Lancaster. The poor girl is stripped naked to look for suckling marks in her body. Uh, she's then sent down to London, looked up by practitioners, then back up the north again, down to London. And after two and a half years of travelling up and down the country, this young boy Robinson said, actually, I made it all up. So you could say that witchcraft, or the superstition surrounding it, absolutely destroyed that young girl's life, and indeed these people that lived in the Forest of Pendle. Were they witches? Well, according to Majesty's government, they still are. Because in 2012, we organised a petition through Morehouse's Brewery Burnley. 12,000 people signed the petition to have them pardoned. But the reply came back from the Home Office in London. These people are enemies of the state and are convicted witches. And there we have the most famous story ever to emanate from the Pendle region. The Pendle Witch Story.